and welcome to today's webinar, Groundbreaking Construction Technology in 2021. This webinar is brought to you by Applied Software. My name is Caitlin Dunn, and I'm pleased to be your moderator today. We encourage you to take advantage of our fully customizable webinar console by clicking on the icons at the bottom of your screen. You can resize any of these widgets during the presentation. <clears throat> Click the help widget if you need assistance. Then you have the slides widget that contains the PowerPoint used for today's presentation. The media player allows you to control the volume. After that, you have the Q&A widget where you can type in questions and comments throughout the presentation. We'll take time to answer questions during and at the end of today's webinar. We're excited to connect with you further. Please take a moment to introduce yourself. For other questions or comments or to request more information, click on the next widget to send us an email. Next is the Facebook widget. Like our page to catch up on the latest trends, training opportunities, and much more. You can take the survey at any time during or after the webinar. The resource widget contains links to check out our free webinar library and register for upcoming webinars. This webinar is being recorded for your convenience. You'll be receiving an email with the recording link for future reference. Find applied software on social media to make meaningful connections, receive special offers, and stay up to date on the newest innovations. And be sure to visit our website, asti.com, to see how to achieve your design and business objectives through our innovative solutions, trading options, and services. Click the link in the resource widget to register for our upcoming webinars and view previously recorded webinars on demand. You can also find a complete schedule of upcoming events, webinars, and trainings on our calendar at asti.com slash calendar. All right, I'm pleased to introduce Blake Douglas. Blake is a Director of Services at Applied Software. Thank you for joining us today, Blake. Take it away. Perfect, thanks for the introduction there, Caitlin. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Uh, with 2020 coming to a close, I wanted to wish you all a happy new year, uh, but also it gives us an opportunity to somewhat look back on uh, what happened in 2020 in terms of construction, technology, uh, how things were changed and adapted uh, pretty rapidly uh, in, in response to everything that was happening. And so I wanted to take this opportunity to discuss the groundbreaking construction technology, what we've seen more or less evolving over the last 365 days or so, and where I think uh, we're going to see the most growth here in the short term, but also uh, some pipe dreams, if you will, on where we're headed in the long term. So I've more or less broken this down into about five different categories uh, as it relates to construction the industry and, and uh, the different types of technology that are evolving. So the first that I wanted to talk about was construction methods. Uh, in 2020, we've seen the need for things like masks, social distancing, and with that on a job site, it more or less limits how we can actually construct different types of buildings. And in that, we saw a massive shift to prefabrication. That was already happening over the last uh, five to 10 years or so, but we saw a huge push to it in 2020, uh, getting as much done away from the job site as possible in more controlled environments. Uh, you could spread people out over the course of multiple warehouses, assemble in a unified location, and then bring uh, those various materials to the job site with less labor required on the job site. And so, I think we'll see that ever expanding, but it, it gets even more impactful when we start to talk about things like modular uh, buildings. With modular, essentially you're prefabricating entire rooms rather than uh, systems. So prefab has been relegated mainly to HVAC, plumbing, electrical with uh, different conduit runs and those sort of things. Uh, but now we're starting to see it expand to full wall panels uh, with rough-in done um, all the way to full rooms being completed and uh, dropped in on site. 
we've also seen uh, a large shift to 3D printing of buildings for two reasons. One, the lack of labor required for the, the 3D printing, uh, but also, two, for uh, saving time and money to get it completed. Uh, you can run a 3D printing robot out there, and it can – I've seen videos of putting up an entire house in less than 24 hours. It's pretty astonishing. So uh, with the increasing demand in housing, people moving away from – larger metropolitan areas this allows them to get a, a home in a space that otherwise maybe there's labor shortages um, schedules look like they would probably be out months uh, you can get one of these uh, 3d printers out on site and, and have yourself a, a home in in 24 hours uh, and the robotic aspect of that is is playing in uh, hugely we're seeing it not only in the 3d printing arm itself uh, but also on job sites to limit the potential exposure to uh, infectious disease by simply having robots instead of human beings performing some of the work. And I'm a, I'm a very visual person, so what I want to do here is, is share some of these different images with you of, of what we're seeing today and the potential of where these could go. So in the top left there, uh, that's one of the largest 3D uh, building 3d printed buildings in the world typically you've seen kind of those studio apartment uh, type size buildings and, and this one is multiple rooms uh, it's going to have multiple levels uh, really exciting stuff there that's taking place over in dubai in the top right you can see that is a modular apartment complex and we're starting to see a lot more modular in areas that you might not expect them to be seen. We're seeing them uh, in apartment buildings. We're seeing them in hospitality and in, in hotels, as well as in hospitals. Anywhere where you can uh, more or less self-contain everything in one unit and drop that in place, I think you're going to see this happen more regularly. And then those bottom two images are going to be those robotics that we talked about. I've seen... Uh, bricklaying robotics, I've seen painting robotics, I've seen uh, robotics used for demolition that will take out all of the uh, flooring. I've seen uh, other robotics that are doing things like um, laying, laying wire and, and conduit. Uh, pretty labor-intensive, usually, uh, now robotics are starting to take over in that space. So really exciting stuff there. I think as um, robotics, the arms themselves, get less expensive over time, you'll start to see that even more and more uh, on job sites, especially as folks see the uh, return on investment there without having to have uh, a labor force in uh, some of those tighter spaces and worry about the confines and, and restrictions associated with COVID regulations. Moving on, uh, we've also seen a big push into uh, smart tools. Over the last, I want to say about three years or so, one of the biggest things that the construction industry has seen is major theft on job sites of tools, and that can be a huge expense. So one thing that the industry pushed towards was putting Wi-Fi locators inside of different hand tools, inside of drills, angle grinders, uh, those sort of things. And it significantly cut down on both stolen uh, tools, theft, but also just loss. Uh, maybe there's multiple trade partners on a job site and one of them picked up the wrong tool by accident. It's easy to go locate that in whichever job site trailer it might be on or whichever truck it, it accidentally got put into. So uh, really impactful there to see that more or less Internet of Things where everything is connected, and uh, that's starting to drive towards additional tools that you might see on the job site uh, going forward. I think in the top left there, you'll see drones. I think you'd be hard-pressed to get on a major construction project on site today and not have a drone be there at some point over the course of the project. They're being used very regularly now for photogrammetry, identifying safety concerns, uh, things that 
you obviously wouldn't be able to do in any other circumstance without a, an unmanned aerial vehicle there. But what we're starting to see a big shift to, potentially, again, as a result of COVID regulations, uh, the lack of uh, available workforce to be on a job site, is actually putting tools on the drones themselves. We're seeing things like uh, drones that have welding capability, uh, drones that are used for uh, dispersing different things. I, I, I saw one recently that was made for agriculture and it was used to distribute uh, fertilizer. So instead of a full airplane flying over, you've got a drone that can um, be easily maneuvered by a, the farmer himself rather than a, a full-blown pilot. Uh, other tools that we're starting to see really regularly there on the right is augmented reality and virtual reality. Augmented reality gives you the ability to look inside walls, to do things that with a 3D-based model that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do on the job site. It also allows people to gain access to a building that they might not otherwise be able to access. Maybe we've reached a limit of the number of personnel that we can have on site based on those uh, COVID regulations. Now you can give access to people that otherwise wouldn't be able to, to get there. And then in that bottom right one, I've been seeing this a lot because of those labor shortages, trying to increase the skill set of the workforce and that virtual reality environment allows them to do so. So you can see that gentleman there is operating. He's got a full control board in front of him, but it makes him immersed in that virtual reality environment to feel like he is actually running that boom. Uh, or it, I've seen welders, again, um, doing weld work on piping and doing it in the virtual environment to ensure that they're getting everything right there before they actually hit the field. It helps to decrease a lot of the costs associated with training those individuals. And then in the bottom left, this is one of those items that is very new, uh, but it's starting to become uh, more viable in the job site. And it's exoskeleton. That gentleman there is wearing exoskeletons to help him with overhead lifts for his shoulders. You can see it's supporting him through the back and it's running through pneumatics. And the reason that we're starting to see this more often is uh, maybe normally it would take two, maybe three people to do that overhead lift, uh, to move heavy pieces of pipe, for example. Now, instead of having those three people in a confined space, uh, potentially exposing them, they have the ability to do it with one person uh, by themselves. So really, really cool stuff there that I think, similar to robotics, as the costs start to come down, we'll start to see a little bit more investment in the field in that way. Next, what we're seeing a big shift in is in materials. So over the last 20 years or so, I would say LEED has really driven owners to want a green building. They want that LEED certification. They want uh, to be as green as possible so that they can realize that return on those uh, green materials, those uh, green pieces of equipment over the long-term ownership of their building. Uh, I want to say it was about 70 to 80 percent of a building's total cost is in operations over the course of its lifespan. Only about 30 percent of the cost is accounted for in actual construction. So anything they can do to minimize that long-term cost they're building, they're going to do. And we're seeing a huge push to that, especially with things like uh, tax incentives. So um, a couple of really innovative materials that I've been seeing that are going to both impact the environmental aspect of building a building, but also the, the longevity. Um, other materials that might be required are uh, big pushes in the industry. The first there in the top left is a permeable concrete. I really like this one. I think that it has a lot of promise. Uh, it's fairly new, 
but they're looking at doing things with this that we couldn't do with other concrete, where we may need uh, different watersheds, additional piping, those sort of things. Now uh, we can really change how we design uh, the overall exterior landscape, um, roadways, et cetera, with this permeable concrete. And then the bottom right, another concrete is a self-healing concrete. You can see that crack there. It has different enzymes in it that live for 200 years, and they can live dormant. And when that crack then has exposure to water vapors, those enzymes become active, and they utilize that water to live. And the byproduct of those enzymes is limestone. And so you can see over the course of time there that that crack actually fills in with, with limestone, which may not be the best solution in a, in a concrete environment, but it's still better than having that crack. Uh, it, it will increase the longevity of that concrete and uh, will allow for less maintenance over the entire lifespan of that concrete. Again, minimizing potential cost over the course of a, a building's life or, or a roadway's life. In the top right, my neighbor actually just had this installed. Uh, this is his house, is a Tesla roof. And the only reason that I knew that it was a Tesla roof is because they had the little sign out in front of their yard when they were having it installed. Otherwise, looking at it, it looks like a normal shingled roof. It, it has a little bit of reflectivity there, uh, but not a lot. And the reason that I think this is going to be really impactful is because, A, the low-profile look of it in terms of historical solar panels on, on houses. That was one of the things that owners often decided not to go with solar is because of the aesthetic of it. Here you can see it. It, it looks like a normal roof. Uh, so that's really going to change how people decide to go to solar. Not only that, but what they do is each house that they go to, they will map the sun, and they'll map it over the course of a year. And any trees or anything like that that's around your house will cast shadows at different times of the year, and they'll optimize the entire roof for where the actual solar panels should go. So the solar panels are built into each one of those shingles, and you may have a roof that uh, because of trees, uh, its orientation, maybe it's pointing uh, in a northwest orientation where it's not going to get the best sun exposure, they'll actually pinpoint in and map out where each one of the solar panels are going to go on your roof. So your roof will look uniform, but maybe only 70% of those shingles have solar capabilities built in. And that's ultimately helps out with the, the cost savings there. Whereas a lot of times with traditional solar panels, you have to have the entire panel and maybe only half of that panel gets sun exposure for the majority of the year. Otherwise, uh, you're essentially wasting that other 50% of that panel. So I think we're going to see a big push to that. I think other solar companies are going to follow suit. And uh, I think you'll see that more regularly on uh, houses, which are a, a big consumer of, of electricity. And then in the bottom left, this is one that is pretty new, and it's something that I am getting really excited about. It's called Smart Glass. And coming from the MEP, I, I came uh, in the industry from a mechanical subcontractor in the control space, this really excites me because the way that we used to handle sun, specifically in the summer when it's when it's warm out, is we would, one of the newest innovative ways to do that was automatic, automatic shades. And we would program the shades based on the time of the year to go up and down based on um, the sun and exposure levels. And it was programming labor intensive. It was um, costly because every window that had to have automatic blinds. Now, without having to do any of the programming, uh, we simply put in this smart glass. And everything associated with this panel of glass is 
built in, it's self-sustaining. And what it does is it looks at essentially where it's located. It gets a geolocation via the Wi-Fi, and it identifies, okay, this time of year, this is the amount of sun exposure I'm going to get. This is the, it's tied to the sun table. And over the course of the day, it can self-shade. And then it can also um, get rid of the shade uh, when it needs to. Uh, the really important thing here that I like is with the shade uh, in the summertime, yeah, you're going to need them. Uh, but in the wintertime, you may still need the shades to block out sun. Um, you may need them to go away so that you can warm the interior of the building. These smart glass uh, windows also have manual control. So in the winter, in the event that you're in a room and there's too much sun, you can't see your computer, you can just dial down that window and bump the tint up as much as you might need. And I've seen ones that will actually go full blackout. Uh, so really, really cool stuff there to look forward to in, in the near future. Next, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about software uh, being uh, with Applied Software, a software company. Uh, we're seeing a big shift in how software is uh, working. What we are typically used to and, and what I've seen with a lot of our customers is that they may have six or seven different point solutions that are great tools. They do exactly what they're intended to do. They help solve a lot of problems for the customers, uh, but they are just that. They're point solutions. Uh, Autodesk is even guilty of doing this. They, they've had some point solutions for a number of years that, albeit they do great things, but they are standalone tools. They may be for a specific department or a specific user to utilize. And what we're seeing now with this work from home environment is a shift to having all of these tools tied together. Integration is becoming massive. Uh, we're getting a lot of data from all of these different tools and then we're able to now tie all of those pieces of data in together into things like Power BI dashboards so that without having a daily meeting in an office, an executive can now see how a particular project is performing or look at an entire region and see how that's going. Uh, so connecting the different pieces of data and the different tools that might be used by different individuals in a virtual environment allows us to work uh, more cohesively in this work from home world that we're living in. So some of the really big things that I am really excited for from Autodesk are uh, in the first top left picture there is the new unified Autodesk build tool. That is taking all of the best functionality from Android and all of the best functionality from BIM 360 and putting them in one common environment. So those field users on the left, they've, they've got to be wearing their masks. Maybe that person on the right might otherwise be on the job site, but because of COVID regulations, there's too many folks on the job site, she's there working in the office. And she now has the ability to get all the connected information from those field users. So you've got that plan grid look and feel for the field. They have the easiest interface, it's really quick to navigate, they have what they need right there in front of them, and then that office user has the ability to potentially go in and add more detail, um, do additional workflows, and uh, get their job done all in one environment. And we'll start to see a lot more evolve over the course of the year uh, with additional functionality there. But th that now allows us to have one location to go get all the data. So maybe we're pulling something like a, um, a schedule in from a different tool, rather than tying that schedule into plan grid for the field folks, uh, BIM 360 for the office folks, and now that schedule, now we have one tool from the field and the office to tie into that schedule. So again, minimizing those different connection points and integrating as much as possible. In the top right, this was my favorite announcement from Autodesk University a couple of months ago is the introduction of the beta for Autodesk Tandem. Tandem is a digital twin tool for building owners and facility managers. 
Now you can take all of that great model information, all of the data that, frankly, owners pay a lot of money to have built out. It's built out in Revit. It's added on to or manipulated or changed over the course of the building cycle, the construction cycle. And then at handover, a lot of times you get a, a big flash drive or it used to be CDs. Uh, I mean, even when I was in the field, it was literally binders of paper that got stored in the security room in the basement. And until something broke, uh, no one even knew where they were. And now what this allows us to do in tandem is get all of that digital deliverable in one location, have all the documentation associated with it, all the submittal packages, um, warranty information, anything you might think of associated with a particular part in a building can be found in tandem. So as you're running facilities maintenance and you've got to swap out, it looks like a valve there is highlighted, you've got to swap out that valve, you can see exactly what valve it is, you can see the inside diameter, outside diameter. You can see the brand, the serial number. You can see if it's under warranty or not. Uh, let's say it's not, you've got to swap it out. You could potentially then find a marketplace directly through Tandem to go and source that material. Uh, maybe it's the exact same one. Maybe it's one that meets all of the exact same specifications and is less expensive. And now when you swap it out, you have that record of when it was swapped out. You have a breadcrumb trail, if you will, of all of the different valves that you've ever put in there. So if you've maybe used five of them over the 20-year lifespan of the building, you can go back and see now you have multiple data points which brand might last the longest. So if the cheapest one went out on you after a year, obviously you're not going to go get that one. You may go for a little bit more expensive one because you have the data point that says this will definitively last longer for me. And then lastly, in that bottom picture is Autodesk acquisition of Pipe. Pipe, for those of you that don't know, is a tool that will read specifications and automatically generate your submittal packages. Really, really cool. Again, kind of the theme of all of this is automation, less user input, um, less chance for human error, go in and it really streamlines what used to be a very, very tedious process. Now Pipe is coming to the Autodesk family and is going to be deeply integrated into the BIM 360 environment or the, the Autodesk build environment going forward so that with the push of a button, you'll have all of your submittal packages and you'll know that something didn't get missed. And what this will ultimately do is feed into what we talked about earlier in tandem to ensure that you have every aspect of data associated with your building when it's completed. So I'm, I'm a big dreamer. Um, I like to think about the future. I like to think about future technology. Uh, I often with my friends get into conversations around uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, autonomous drones, uh, get into conversations around blockchain and what that will mean for the future of humankind. And uh, I, I think humans naturally like to think about what the future might bring. Uh, people were thinking about flying cars back in the 60s uh, when cars were still running on carburetors. You know, they, they didn't even imagine the technology that we have in cars now. They just jumped to flying cars. And we aren't there now. We're getting close. But um, I wanted to quickly discuss some things that I think could be really impactful for construction going forward. Uh, these tend to be for uh, more for infrastructure construction than vertical construction. But uh, the two that I'm really excited about is uh, kinetic footfall energy and uh, solar roads. So the kind of what could be of energy generation. Uh, in the left there, you can see those pads. They have some of these located on the sidewalks in uh, Seoul, South Korea, where the actual footsteps create vibrations. Those vibrations, that energy uh, is transferred then into the pad. And in Seoul, in those areas, they're actually powering all of their streetlights just from the individuals walking uh, on their streets. And I have 
done a little bit of research on this. One of the things that I think is really promising is to get energy from sports complexes. So if you're putting in AstroTurf on a football field, think about how much energy those players put out literally into the ground to move over the course of a game. Uh, that energy now can be harnessed in the form of uh, electricity and by converting that kinetic energy. So really exciting stuff there, I think. Uh, we'll see an expansion of that. Uh, hopefully, as we see uh, deeper investment at the federal level into infrastructure, that may be something that they start to incorporate. But speaking of uh, federal funding and infrastructure roads, we, we all know that in the United States, on average, we have a very, very aging roadway system. Uh, a lot of the highways are being uh, maintained and not really adapted to the amount of people in a specific area. And I think as you see uh, that slight shift away from the major metropolitan areas, I think you'll start to see an increase in need for roadways exterior to those um, increasing their capacity. And one of the things that I'm really excited about is solar roadways. There are a couple of different things that, that this really solves. One, uh, if you took all of the roads in the United States, granted that, that's a big undertaking, but if you took all of them and you converted them to solar, uh, we would never need a uh, power plant in the form of coal power plants, water generation, uh, nuclear power plants, you wouldn't need one in the United States. This would literally achieve all of the energy needs of uh, the United States. Uh, two, what this could potentially also do is you could embed uh, chargers in the solar roadway. So things like electric vehicles, thinking Tesla again, uh, you can tell I'm a big fan of Tesla. If one of, the, one of the big knocks on Tesla, one of the main reasons I haven't gotten one, is their uh, range. If you need to go a long distance and there's not a charging station in between uh, where you are and where you're going, well, you have to take the gas vehicle. And in this case, it, it's not a matter of having to go to the charging station. It's you are continuously charging. Uh, this would potentially allow you to eliminate one of the biggest costs associated with uh, those vehicles and the biggest uh, weight, uh, the biggest piece of mass in those vehicles and the batteries. You could limit those sizes because now you don't need range because you're continuously charging. Uh, you're literally operating off of the solar road that you're running on. And as autonomy comes in, uh, some of these things will be integrated. But if you see here, you've got the slow, and that is a uh, a light that is displayed inside of the road and those yellow markers are also lights. So what in theory, again, you could do, say you had a four lane highway and there was an accident in the far right lane. Now, potentially you can utilize those lights in a smart environment to maybe navigate those four lanes around that accident and potentially then maybe use that shoulder for, 500 feet or whatever the case may be, shifting all the lanes over and really adapting to what the traffic might call for. So really exciting stuff there, uh, just probably very, very far off into the future, um, but uh, maybe not that far in, in terms of um, if we can get there, if, if the technology presents a, a viable ROI, then I think we'll, we'll see it sooner rather than later. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for sitting in and listening with me. Uh, this was really fun to do. A lot of uh, time and research was spent on my personal time because I enjoyed looking at this and having conversations with my colleagues and friends about the uh, opportunity for technology to, to grow here in the short term and in the long term. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Blake. Yeah, we just have a couple of poll questions for you guys to answer. So we'll give you a minute to submit your answers to those.
And Caitlin, look, looking over this, I, uh, I I appear to have missed the software piece. So um, if software is what you think will be most impactful or what you're most excited for, throw that in that other category. And uh, if you want to have a conversation with myself, uh, anyone at Autodesk or anyone else at Applied Software around those different Autodesk tools that are soon to be released, uh, feel free to reach out. We've got access to the different beta programs, those sort of things. So uh, happy to get you involved with those uh, if you think that they could be impactful for your business. So uh, feel free to put that in the chat or use any of the different communication methods that Caitlin mentioned at the beginning of the webinar. All right. It looks like um, not everybody answered, um, but that's okay because it might not apply to them. So we'll move on to the next to show everybody the results. Wow. Like overwhelmingly construction methods. That's wonderful. Yeah, Caitlin, I, I really agree with everyone there. Um, with prefabrication, uh, taking up so much, it's picking up a lot of speed in terms of adoption. I think modular is going to pick up more speed. Robotics is going to pick up more speed. Um, and things like modular and 3D printing and robotics, those aren't entirely new to us as uh, humankind, right? Those things mm -hmm. have been around for a long period of time in manufacturing. Um, namely because of the different controlled environments that they could operate in. And now we're starting to see that shift to construction. And I think it will have the most impact in the near future as well. Definitely, definitely. All right, we have one more poll question for you guys to answer. So I'll go ahead and do that. And I'll give you guys a minute to answer this one as well. Yeah, so I guess the intent here with this is really just gauge what everyone's most excited for. I think um, excitement will also bring potentially money to that space. So if, uh, if you're like me and you're as excited about the solar glass, I think that's something that's going to be uh, really big in the future. If everyone's excited about solar glass, all the owners want it, everyone that's a tenant or um, inside of those buildings would love to see that. I think you'll see a big push towards it. I think industry will, will kind of follow suit of that excitement. So we wanted to gauge everyone's excitement here. Again, in that other field, uh, if it's the solar roads, if it's that kinetic footfall energy, type that in the chat, or uh, if it's those Autodesk tools that you're really excited for, uh, if that's what gets you jazzed and, and you heard about it at AU or through this presentation and you want to hear more about it, feel free to uh, throw that in the chat and we'll, we'd be happy to have a, a deeper discussion with you. All right, only a couple of you guys are answering. I know some of you have to be excited for this stuff. All right, we can go ahead and move on to the poll results. Wow, pretty even split there. I, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little disappointed. People weren't as excited about the smart glass, but I can see the uh, the appeal, especially of drones as those expand and exoskeletons. I think those will be really intriguing. And then uh, the construction methods, yeah, I mean, looking at what robotics could ultimately do for buildings, I think is, is also really exciting. So it's somewhat in agreement there, but really wish I had some more votes for that smart glass. 
Yeah, me too. Smart Glass sounds like it's going to be a really exciting thing that's coming up. Well, all right. That's um, all the poll questions we have. So um, if there are any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat right now. Um, Blake, you did awesome. Uh, if there's anything else you want to tell the audience, like how to contact you or anything, um, if you'd like to apply, uh, contact Applied Software, you can email us at any time. You can also visit our website, like I said. Um, we're big on LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah, what about you, Blake? How can they contact you? Yeah, I'm a pretty regular uh, visitor of LinkedIn as well. So you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, just look me up by my name um, or through uh, Applied Software. Or you can email me directly if you'd like. Uh, my email is bdouglas, pretty easy, at asti.com, short and sweet. So if you do have any direct questions that I might be able to help answer or uh, if you just want to talk about this stuff, like I said, this gets me really excited. So I could probably talk your ear off, but I'd also love to hear from you what you're seeing out there in industry, uh, what uh, you're finding uh, regularly and, and what you're excited about. Uh, I, I think that would be uh, a lovely conversation to have. Great. Okay. I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, so yeah, everyone, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate you spending your time with us and we trust that it was meaningful and impactful for you and your business. We look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Blake. That was wonderful. You did a great job. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.